I totally agree with you. I'm sure you do. <laughs> I, I think we caught that on tape, and I'm I'm going to edit that one in about. Oh, she she agrees with everything I said. I am having a wonderful <laughs> chat already, and it's three o'clock in the afternoon for me. It's six uh, your time. Yes. You must have a dinner date at seven. I'm sure of it. Well, uh, I was hoping to, but I saw my husband already pouring wine for himself, so he's uh, not waiting for me. But no, yes, it'll be nice. It's just I appreciate it getting it out of the way. <laughs> <laughs> okay, me, me too, actually. And I, what I, we, we're both having fun here. But And by the way, I, I what a tease to pour a glass of wine and then sit there and sip it while you're having to chat at me. That's terrible. <laughs> That's marriage for you. Okay, I am having, I forgot to mention, I'm having a wonderful uh, interview with flutist Julie Skolnick. We're going to talk about your 2022 Navona Records 2CD set of the complete uh, Bach flute sonatas. And before everybody goes, oh no, not again, um, I want to just make sure everybody is really clear. And I remembered about the, I've uh, forgotten the violinist now, but it's the same message to everyone, especially with these Bach works. Everybody can play them any way they want, and it's all good. You know what I mean? It's interpretation, it's style, it's individual taste, it's, it's all the rest of it. And what I want to say, just right off the top of my head, I spent the day with you listening to these sonatas, and we've mentioned, I, used, I played them horribly, I'm sure, uh, as a clarinetist playing flute when I was in high school, and I fell in love with them. Then, this is the magic about these flute sonatas. There's something, we're talking about Bach, by the way, J.S. Bach, we think mostly, uh, based on a conversation we had a minute ago. I'll shut up here in a minute. But, uh, the, but just the, the, this is just a superb uh, recording of these six wonderful J.S. Bach flute sonatas. And we'll discuss why in just a minute. Hang on, I'm almost done. And the other beautiful thing, uh, have I mentioned your name yet, Julie Skolnick, uh, uh, is that your accompanist is your daughter, Sophie. Skolnick Brower, and I have to say, I don't know how people live these multiplistic lives, and we have it's in in the program notes, and you and I have discussed it. You do the do the same thing, but where you are so engaged, your daughter is in Mexico doing social work as we speak, and the first thought that went through my musician said was, no, no, the hands, the hands. <laughs> anyway, it just a brilliant uh, collaboration naturally, if you will, which makes the whole thing special. And the other thing, and we're going to get there a little later in the conversation, and then I'll let you get a word in edgewise, is about positivity. These, this recording, this two-disc recording that you have made of these uh, box sonatas are joy personified. Okay? I'm so happy. So yeah, thank you. That's what we have going on here. And I'm, I'm thrilled that to have this opportunity to realize that, that, man, they never get stale, they never grow old, and sometimes they jump off the page, and you have really lived with them all your life and, and so on. So first, a little bit about Julie Skolnick. We'll, we'll go through the uh, the details here just a little bit. Um, you're in your 26th year. Now, that's unique all by <laughs> itself. Uh, as founder and artistic, yeah, I presume you founded and art, our artistic director of Mistral Music, and that is such a cool name. And it's a series of ensemble, uh, uh, a series and ensemble that you founded with your husband, the physicist. What? See what I mean, everybody? About uh, people that have all these different. I have a hard time just getting up in the morning and focusing on one thing at a time. Um, with your <laughs> husband, physicist Michael Brower in 1997. So the whole thing about the longevity of this festival uh, of, of series of concerts that you do is, is just marvelous anyway, all by itself. So that's a break with something. Uh, you know what I mean about, oh, well, we need fresh. We need fresh. Nah, nah, we don't need that. Like with conductors, boards have to always have fresh. Uh, yeah. Never <laughs> used to be that way. <laughs> um, you've por performed as principal flutist in lots of Boston area uh, orchestras, and I know why. Uh, and your daughter uh, and son, Sophie and Sasha, um, are both musicians. And, you know, part of me wants to weep because I never really had that opportunity, but to have just the family of musicians, it, it must be magical. Um, uh, you've received treatment and, and have recovered from breast cancer in 2005 and I want to we'll, we'll touch on it because it's part of everything really things that happen to us and I want to just bring this get this in right away 
The reason I'm so interested is, A, I'm interested in history a lot. And for me, the 40 years before a major catastrophic event and the 40 years after a major catastrophic event, let's call it, call it the Napoleonic Wars or World War I or World War II, are, continue to have catastrophic after effects that psychologically just damage whole continents of human beings. We have just come through COVID. And I am convinced that very few people understand clearly that we as humans, as every living animal on the planet, have been in some way profoundly <laughs> changed by that event. That's why I want to talk about and have you discuss with us breast cancer. Not only that, just to and I, I promise you'll get a word in, but I got to get through, the, through this stuff. It's wonderful. Not only that, talk about multitasking. <laughs> I'm referring to Julie's book, your memoir, a fic, fictional memoir based on true fact. Well, yeah, no, no, no. Uh oh, stop Not me. Fiction. Fiction. True story. Oh. Not fiction. Oh, true story. Okay, so it is a memoir indeed. Okay. It's called Paris Blue, published in 2021. Interestingly, while you were also recording the, the, <laughs> the CD of the Box Sonatas, uh, and here I have to read this quote, and then I'll let you get a word in, okay? Here is a quote about. Paris Blue, and you know what's coming. Quote, not every true story is like a good novel. That's where I got a little confused. But this one is, not every memoir of first love has a satisfying ending, but this one does. The confluence of first love with becoming an artist makes this memoir special. End quote. One of America's great novelists and writers, John Irving, said that about your memoir. So is everybody ready to uh, fasten your seatbelts, folks, because we, we are really, uh, we're, we're really going to get going. Can you just start with, finally, it's your turn. Or can you just kind of give us, it's, it always sounds corny, but I know people really want to hear, I want to hear it because I was there once upon a time, that moment when sudden, what, when you were eight, when you were 28, whatever, when you said, ah, this is it, flute and a career. Oh, the music. That's a very easy question. For me, it happened when I was about 13 years old at an idyllic music camp mm -hmm. in Maine. Mm -hmm. And in fact, I mentioned this in, in my book yeah. too. Yes, because um, the book really traces 30 years of my life and I, there are lots of flashbacks that are important moments, that influential and transformative moments. And at this particular place by a lake in Maine, um, I finally connected with these 13, 14, 15 year olds who were all in love with music and, the, and the, to the same level that I was at, at the same level. And um, the loudspeakers planted in the woods broadcast wow. Brahms symphonies wow. and Beethoven symphonies, um, awaking us from our woodland cabins, you know, um, at six, seven in the morning. And it was as if the trees had burst into song. And after connecting with these kids, my uh, with these my my peers like that, um, I came home and and heard a Schubert cello quintet that I had heard my friends re rehearsing every day all summer, and uh, you know my eyes filled with tears. And I think that was a moment that I knew that music would be my life. It wasn't clear from the very first years of playing the flute at age 10 and 11, because I was very very serious ballet dancer back then. But from a very young age, 13, 14, I, I knew then. Wow, what a story, and it's so great, and it's so creative, and it's so, well, I could have done ballet, but uh, you know, I really fell in love with flute. I might have been a physicist like my husband, but then again, I changed my mind at age 10. I mean, it's amazing. <laughs> I exaggerate somewhat, but you know what I mean. But I said I could have done ballet. I, I All I said was I was very interested in it. That's, that's even harder than music. Fair enough. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. Yeah. That, that's great. And I, and I just wanted to kind of know this story because it speaks to, to yeah. everything, just the, the love of whatever we, whatever that is, whatever that magic is that just gets us, gets us excited. Um, what about this, um, what is this connection with France that you have? Is it, is it psychic? Is it happenstance? Is it love? What is it? You go to well, France regularly okay. now for several years. Go ahead. Sorry. Yeah, it's so hard to know whether I'm going to go the music route or the book route, but I'll just tell you that, um, so when I was about 17 and, and then 19, again, I went to a big flute festival in southern France, uh, in Nice, and I kind of fell in love with the culture. I went back for my school year abroad, uh, my junior year abroad from Wesleyan University, 
that's where I met this Frenchman and fell madly in love when I joined the chorus of the Orchestra of Paris. And it was really a story of love at first sight and um, very also about first love. And we sang all these big choral works together and he was married and had a child. And that's what that's you can find all about that. <laughs> Complications. But um, France, yes, I mean, it, both my husband and I are, are, you know, French lovers. We both speak the language. Um, and we, um, you know, are Francophiles. So we both went to, to Provence during our honeymoon, I think. And it oh. was one of those things where um, it just deepened. And now we have lots of connections in France. I, for a while, I was giving a concert every fall at Salle Corteau in Paris, a beautiful, beautiful little concert hall. And now um, we've been going to Provence every summer for about 15, 16 years. And I give a concert there for the village. And it's a real uh, de democratizer, democrat, is that the word? Um, people who've been working in the vineyards for 500 years, generations come, as well as expats who are from London and Italy and Australia. The whole village comes together and enjoys this outdoor concert. And it's been so much fun. It's why I have so many friends there now. We know a lot of people. Speaking so of, that's the and speaking of social work, you know what I mean? I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, don't mean to make fun. It's the very, very important mission that all of us have in the arts, particularly now, uh, to make some kind of connection, to make, help people understand how, how not important, but how elevating, how, how vigorous for the mind, how spectacular, oh, you know, the arts, You're all of it absolutely preaching to the choir now because that has been my elevator speech since founding my own music series you know you have to raise a lot of money in 26 years to keep uh, an ensemble or series um, going I know this uh, and so uh, <laughs> you know ever since the beginning that's what and, and even almost every uh, you know every year when we have to make an appeal to keep the support coming in that's what I have to remind our music lovers. I mean, we have lots of followers who love our concerts. We also have to remind them that music is not an extra. It's not sheer entertainment and fluff that you can cut from budgets. It's our, our it's our water and our air. And you know, if you want to bring it back to, um, since you did bring up the breast cancer experience that I had, two two or three, in fact, four big events that I have organized in my life were um, benefit concerts to to support um, défavorisé, how do we say, underserved, that's the French word because I've given this talk in French as well, underserved women who have experienced and going or are going through breast cancer. And so for three different times I got um, Simon Rattle to come and conduct full orchestra concerts at my invitation. I put together a hundred musicians planned the program, made the speech, and we raised $100,000 for these women. And I couldn't agree with you more that that is part of one of the things we do. It's not just putting on pretty concerts, but it's using music in a way that we can feel good about, um, you know, giving back to the world. You know, I never, I never ran a race for the cure. I never wore pink ribbons or joined support groups for, for breast cancer survivors. And in fact, I very I rarely really identify with them as a group, as a survivor. But when I was finished with my treatments, I, um, I knew there was something that I could do because I was so well connected in the music world. I could put on Thanks. a concert and get a kind of a, a musical race for the cure. And it was each time it's been such a love fest because musicians from all over the country came together and everybody was donating their time, including Simon Rattle. Glad you answered um, that question because uh, you are indeed an entrepreneur. Uh, and I, I've been an entrepreneur myself, off and on, up and I, down, failure, success, yes. failure, success. <laughs> it's hard. It's just plain hard, hard all the it time. Is, it's so much work and it's so much administrative stuff that we all hate, and yet it's worth every minute. When the, when the final concert happens, and you see the emotion and you feel the love and you see that you're doing some good and you see the tears in the audience, um, that's what it's all about. That's why, that's why we're moved to continue to do it. 
I'm going to bounce back just a little bit because I just came yes. upon a little a little synopsis of Paris Blue. Yes. Uh, you, okay. you, it's, it, I've read it, you, you know it too. Uh, set against a magical backdrop of Paris and classical music, Paris Blue is a true fairy tale memoir with a dark underbelly. I guess I'm going to have to read the book. Uh, <laughs> uh, about the tenacious grip of first love. And you know, I'm, you know, you made us all. You this me memoir makes us all think about that first love, and it's tenacious, all right. Sometimes even quite destructive, mm -hmm. or self-destructive, and so forth. So everybody, there it is, Paris Blue. I see it behind you on the music stand. Yes, of course. I had to do that, of course, because there you go. Show us. Oh, show us. Constantly trying to plug it. Hey, by the way, what's the award? It looks like you've got a gold seal award or something. I do. I have 16 awards for this book. Oof. When, this is one that um, people told me was one in particular to be proud of. It's called the Pencraft Award, mm. and I got first place in memoir, so that was nice. Well, there you go. Now, let's get back to music, because the, the, the very interesting thing is you also play flute impeccably. Uh, the sound cool. is huge. I guess I have to ask, is there a special instrument? What's that instrument? Anything oh. special, or is it you and your lips? Oh, I'm just so happy you liked it that much, Dan. Oh. Thank you. Um, well, you know, I'll just show people my CD. Please do. And by the way, all this will go up at performingartsreview.net with uh, links and all the rest. Um, okay. <laughs> I'm glad you separated, you know, told us I, the difference between you and your daughter. You know, I, I just love that you mentioned that it's beautiful playing because, oh, you know, going into this project, I did know there are one million recordings out there, um, but... There aren't that many with piano, number one, and there aren't that many mother-daughter duos. <laughs> so, and then there's the playing. I hope, thank you for saying that the playing is so beautiful because I hope we did special things with it. I wanted to play with piano, as you know, because it gives you so much more uh, range of dynamics and expression and you can make magic moments in a way that you cannot do with a harpsichord. And, um, and we just enjoyed putting them together and finally putting our mark on this repertoire. But in terms of the instrument, um, well, you know, everyone has their, his own sound, her own sound. Um, I have a beautiful flute, but um, they, you know, there are a lot of, what people believe these days is that you always end up sounding like yourself. Somebody could hand me um, a $200 flute, I would probably sound pretty much the same on it. The reason I say that is that Galway did this little trick once when he was playing with Berlin Phil, and people kept asking, should it be gold, silver? What what instrument do you like the best? And, and he said, you know, you want to always sound like yourself. And he, just to prove the point, he recorded a, a major symphony on a $200 Gemeinhardt or something, and nobody even could tell the difference. So I don't really think that's true. But I do believe that it's crazy for some flutists to make, to be searching constantly for the instrument, the instrument that they need for their sound. I have never been, what, I found a flute that I loved about a good 20 years ago. And um, it's a Brandon Cooper. It is a gold flute um, with a Dana Sheridan head joint. Flutists are always mixing and matching the head joint and the Everybody's body. Everybody's taking notes. You know, there yeah. are lots of faculty and, flutists out there, yeah. And um, it's worked for me ever since, you know, I um, I like the way it feels. I have two flutes, one silver and one is gold, in case um, in case something goes wrong. In case you one. need money. <laughs> I couldn't <laughs> resist that. I'm sorry. <laughs> you know, which one do I sell? Oh, the gold one, here. Yeah. Anyway. It is, they both feel a little bit different. Mm. Gold is a more resistant metal, so you have to work a little bit harder. I'm oh, interested. Yeah. Yes, that, does, that makes perfect little, sense. You get a little more depth for your money every time you put in more but you get more back mm -hmm. but silk sometimes feels so good because it's so effortless and that's basically how i feel about them when i play that's correct and we touched on this on what you have just hit upon and we're going to spend a little more time there uh before we taped and that that is exactly what you've just described we were talking about how i responded today when i first sat down to listen and I not only did the memories flood back, that's all fine and dandy and put you in a certain mood, but I found total massive positivity. <laughs> not not, uh, not academica, forgive me everybody on the faculties over there, but what I'm trying to say is sometimes people seem, as you just described, 
to be trying to figure out how to play it differently or how to play it with a little more of this or a little less of that or like so and so did or like and, you know and it's crazy and that's exactly the point of these sonatas that everybody knows it's like your your own personality and i just we've had the talk positivity is it and it's not just a silly vacuous word it's a very important energy and that's what you put out that's what makes the playing so superb also i was not surprised that this was not necessarily some kind of fancy pants uh, flute with all kinds of extra stuff but that's why i asked and you you answered it exactly right what comes through that chunk of metal is you and you and you and that that just to run it into the ground just slightly further it's the positivity of it all now let me j chatter just a bit more and then, then I'll think I'll try and find another question but this is what I love and you know it very well about what I heard between you and your daughter now this is a woman who as we speak I think we've mentioned this is in Mexico doing social work helping helping people and I kept, as I, as I told, told you, uh, Julie, I kept my fun response was, no, no, the hands, the hands. What are you going to do with it? You know, do you, does she wear gloves when she's in Mexico? And the, the reason for that is this is just absolutely stellar pianism. Mm. It's exactly correct. It's flawless. It's absolutely superb collaborative playing, as you know very well, the way you two play. I kept listening for the slightest fraction of of uh, of different brains <laughs> and it wasn't so you two are just totally insane it's a glorious recording for all those reasons oh man i hope you put that all in writing so i can uh, use it um to sell <laughs> we'll, we'll see we'll see it. i i really really love hearing that thank you so much um part part of this dan and, and that's why i'm so appreciative that you offered this interview um because of my book um, I have been I've been putting almost on besides running my series and then recording the CD um, I have put all my marketing efforts into um, getting people to read my book so I have done almost zero with the CD so I'm really really happy that um, you've you're, you're saying such nice things about it because um, you know nobody actually buys CDs anymore but they do stream them and I'm hoping that um, people will want to take a listen so thank you and that is an interesting situation we're in. Again, I'm not a, you know, I'm not a, in, into this whole angle of the business, but it's interesting how even CDs have become a little passe. I'm not sure they're gone altogether. Yeah. You, you know what? I have to tell you that sometimes yeah. I try to do a giveaway, even at our concerts, where there are a lot of old people, and those uh -huh. are the ones who have CD players. But even amongst those guys, um, I'll say, you know, we're doing a giveaway today. And I ask some question. We try to make it really fun and un uh -huh. unstuffy and unpredictable. That's our motto. And um, and and I say something like, um, who has um? I'll say I'll give you. Uh, you've just won a CD, and they say I don't have a CD player. Or uh, to a bet more better example is I just gave a talk at Harvard Medical School. I'm just bragging now, because um, you do this twice a year or something, as far as yes, I recall. Exactly. Yeah. About um, one is about breast cancer, and the other is about my collapsed lung that I went through from playing from playing modern music. That's another whole story. I don't want to waste too much time. That's another book. <laughs> I do. I do spend about 10, 15 minutes in a class every year, telling mm. about how telling them about how my lung collapsed from playing high stratospheric. High ah. deeps over and over again. But anyway, the point of the story is that I said, um, whose birthday is it today? And I said, okay, does anyone have a CD player? And not a single millennial, you know, in, the, in that age range has one anymore. They, yeah. nobody owns CDs anymore. They don't play CDs. Even cars don't have CD players anymore. So. And this very day, as I went to, you know, put on your CDs, you, said, you kindly sent me the two CD set, because this is something I'm gonna throw on for myself, and I never do that. Nice. Because I'm busy, you know what I mean? I'm My life is listening and all that anyway, so I, basically, I'm sure lots of professional musicians uh, have this thing where you really just, you, you play what you're playing, not not for, exactly. not for leisure anymore. But this is this is leisure, again, because of the attitude that just jumps out, out at at you, and, and we'll go on. I don't want to talk it to death, but but this this idea of individual personality is so true, and the, the, your interpretation, for lack of the other ten thousand words that are necessary, is is just superb. But help! I kind of lost my train of, of thought. 
Well, I'm just going to interrupt you, and then yeah. your thing will come back, maybe. Sure. Yeah. I wanted to say something earlier about how touched I am that you said it brought back memories for you. Because because we're talking about the book at the same time, the one comment I got about, my, nobody said about my flute, that about the Bach, that it brought back their memories from their own past. But my book, however, has resonated deeply with hundreds of people who have written to me and said that they could not stop sobbing at the end because ah! it, brought, they, it brought back, and I'm talking about grown heterosexual men who wrote to me, and, and, and not wow. not 20 somethings, 60 year old men who said, I, number one, I couldn't put your book down, and number two, I couldn't stop sobbing at the end because it just struck such a deep chord and reminded me of my own first love. And so I thought there was a beautiful connection between your response to the CD and what people have been writing to me about the book. So There is, and I'm the old guy that cried when Titanic came to the movie houses, not about the event, but, but about the ship. <laughs> I wept in just the opening things about the glory of this ship. Forget the love, love story. But any, anyway, well, wonderful. That's just wonderful, which means I'll never be able to read the book. No. <laughs> and by the way, I'm just going to do a little plug for it. And if you can get it on Kindle for three bucks. And nice. you oh, it. I didn't realize that. I didn't. I'm no. a kind of big Kindle guy. Yeah. Oh, good. And also, I, I just finished recording it uh, for people who like to listen. So you and and any nice. independent bookstore can order it, and it's also on the Big Evil Empire Amazon, of course. Okay. Yeah. Very interesting. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's a love hate yeah. uh, situation with Amazon. But thanks, because that reminded me about delivery systems. And and you're quite right. CDs are because as I started to say before, I lost track of my mind. Um, I was, you know, getting, you know, sticking your CD into my detached, you know, CD player, and I realized somebody gave that to me because at some point, as we all know, computers updated and said, sorry, no, no more CD slot, you know. So I was just thinking this very day, what if that conks out on, on me? And of course, the truth is that it's all, it's all on the internet anyway. So. Exactly. I, I feel sad about it that um, I have, you know, thousands of, C of CDs that mm -hmm. I kept buying and kept buying it's yeah me too drawers we all do yeah and um i don't go into those drawers that often it's so easy to find what you want to listen to on spotify right. uh, you know so it's good the thing yeah. is it's good it's you at first there's the sadness uh, you know yeah. oh i missed the telegraph this telephone thing i did you know and so on yeah, it's, yeah. Just, it's just it's <laughs> just human nature Let's see. I'm, I want to see. So again, two discs. Uh, let me make sure I've asked any any and all of the pertinent <laughs> questions that I was putting together here. Uh, I think so. We talked about France. We talked uh, about the novel um, uh, and who you are and why you are. Uh, uh, much more. Sorry about that. Because um, because it, it's. No, oh, I like your style. You know, you're. I, I like your very unstuffy style. That's what our concerts are all about, too. So it's nice. Thank you. I'm glad to hear that loose and easy is is okay with some people at least. Um, let, let's kind of have have you know we're we're not going to talk about about all of the sonatas. I mentioned to you that there's one that I think might be worth spending a little time on, and you might have another that somehow hits home. Uh, but how about just uh, we may have even talked this idea to death, but. You went in deliberately knowing that there are 10 gazillion recordings of these sonatas. And about what we were speaking a little earlier, and it's okay, people will go, oh, I've got to find something else. I've got to hold about the complete flute sonatas of uh, Lezinski or something. You know what I mean. Um, is, the, is this a, a legacy thing? It, it is partially that, exactly. You know, whether one person or a thousand people hear it, I wanted to record them. Um, have them, have them for posterity. Really, mm -hmm. it's um, who knows whether my daughter and I will make another CD or not together. But we've put these down, mm -hmm. and we're proud of them. Mm -hmm. And it's our, it's our vision of what this music should sound like. And you know, I have to admit that there are a lot of them out there, but I, I don't love a lot of the recordings that I've heard. And um, and I'm I love trying it. to keep a straight face. Yes. Yeah. And I'm so. I mean, I mean, of course, there are wonderful ones, yeah. but I'm not. There are not five million wonderful ones, and I love it more with piano. That's the, the main difference. I love these sonatas with piano, and. Um, but let I, me jump in on that be, before yeah. I forget. Yeah. 
old you know i'm 75 now and it's it's a joy because i can jump in i can interrupt people with, with the excuse that i'm going to lose the thought uh, I, i'm just thinking that you you know it does matter who your collaboration partner is you know very well and the, and your daughter is a superb pianist i mean just knockout pianist and she, and as i've mentioned again and i and i have it in my notes for each of the sonatas this this consciousness it's it it's you know in a, at a professional level it's expected of course th this kind of knowledge but but sophie is so um so totally aware she's so delicate when it's appropriate for example in the in the in the first let me now we can dip into the pieces a little bit because i noticed that right away for in the in the a ma in the uh, hang on hang on in the uh, c major that opens disc one let me try and find it here um this she's not even there in a way which mm -hmm. is exactly right for that C major uh, sonata. We're talking uh, BWV 1033 for those taking notes, um, and and also and especially because it's a modern instrument, the piano. So I mm -hmm. so I, I remember listening to uh, 1033 and thinking, oh, this is so delicious. She's so discreet. It's so clean and clean and, and, and in the background and everything, perfect. By the yeah. fourth sonata, I where she gets lots to do, the A major. She's, uh, oh yeah. She's very present when she needs yeah. to be, and so on. So this, you know, it, collaboration is crucial, and I do hope you two will consider uh, between trips to the Amazon for your daughter that that she might stop by and do, <laughs> do something else. But it's also, I know, very special when it's appropriate. You don't go hunting. It's right? so nice to. Oh, thank you so much. I hope she. I hope my daughter will sit still long enough to listen to those things that you said about her. Um, but um, yeah, she's she's a very unusual person in that she feels her calling is equally as a to help people with um, therapy and their with social work. And mm -hmm. you know, she tells us stories about what she's going through down there, and it's it's very impressive. It's unbelievable, Stunning. really. And yep. and what about Misha, your son, who's a cellist? Uh, yes, yeah, Sasha. So Sasha, it's so excuse nice. me. Uh, yeah, no, it's easy. I mix those two up too. It's nice of you to ask. He, um, well, both my children have done something a bit unusual. He he was a very serious cellist. Went through um, Harvard NEC dual degree program, where he got a, a master's in cello and an undergraduate degree at Harvard, and then he. Um, went to Juilliard for a degree in master's in conducting. And uh, he decided he wanted to go over to the dark side, as I call it, which is conducting, as you are uh, well uh, versed. And now he's in Amsterdam on another in, in another conducting program um, where he's, um, it's kind of a half in between stage type of thing where he's professional these few months for the Vienna Symphony and he's also kind of under the tutelage of some conductors there. So it happened when um, the pandemic came and there was nothing for him to do as a conductor after Juilliard was over. So we decided to do this program in Amsterdam. Uh -huh. And who knows what the future brings him. It's a little hard for me, if I want to be very honest, that he wants to choose conducting over cello because he was a fabulous cellist, even though he's not giving up music and it will all get translated into his conducting. And um, if he really feels, and I do understand that it, conducting is really his calling, because he loves it so much and is so impassioned by it. So um, I'm happy for him, Good. even though it's a hard, he chose the hardest possible thing. He could, You've he lost could him. <laughs> You've lost him. He's clearly going to be a conductor. There's no doubt in my mind whatsoever. But the cello will always be there, of course. I mean, we're talking about uh, app, not even, no, it isn't apples and oranges. It's oranges and oranges. You know what I mean? It's all within within this profession. And he knows Boeing. Yes, exactly. So he's like think, light years above think, a whole lot of conductors. I do think that being an actual musician who really understands what it's like having played 20 years in an orchestra yeah, yeah, um, from age yeah. five, five up, you know, that that will that will yeah, be yeah, only yeah, great yeah. as a conductor, you know. And not only that, it sounds already from what you've just said in the past sentence, that he is a humanist, as is your entire family, apparently, from what I understand of just chatting with you for a bit. You know what I mean about this humanism? He will he will project yeah, yeah. a humanistic approach to understanding and interpreting music uh, uh, as a conductor. 
and, and, and we all know it. that the orchestral repertoire is sub-basement after sub-basement after subtext. So more power yeah. to him. That's great. I feel so inadequate. Never mind. Okay. <laughs> so we kind of touched. I think I mentioned that the the first three on disc on disc one. We're talking about the C major. Let me thumb on down here. Yeah, get 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 the goodie. The, oh, sorry. Yeah, get a drink. That helps. Uh, the G minor, ten thirty four. Uh, the uh, the E minor, ten thirty four. Also, and then the, the the fourth one comes up, and I put little stars. Boom, 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 boom. The A major, and we spoke a little bit about. It. But it, it's a it's a mix of the sonatas, and I, I even kind of had a, a distractedly kind of quickly had a look at the two edition, you know, the two two editions to see if there yeah. was some sense. But you've done this one deliberately on your own. You've decided where they place where they feel correct. And I, and I, and you might want to speak to that in, in just a second. But I, but I'll tell you that, that that fourth sonata, the A major, is like a revelation. It's so completely different from the preceding three, which is wonderful to experience. Go. So beautiful, isn't it? I remember, you know, I, I, I don't know, you must have read my little notes from Julie Skolnick in, in the book, but um, I really feel that these sonatas, probably for every flutist out there, are they're like members of one's family because you, we've lived with them since we were, you know, good enough to play the first one at age 13 or 14. And, you know, for me, it was the E flat major when I first learned, started learning them. And then I remember which one I played in high school for my senior recital in high school, and then which one I played for my master's recital at NEC, New England Conservatory, and then which movements I pull out every time I need a poignant movement at either a memorial service or a friend's wedding or something like that. And uh, the A major was the one I played for my undergrad recital at Wesleyan. And I remember loving just the the joy, the joy of the last movement, the part that goes, you know which part I mean by that? You even sing with a little bit of perfect tenuto. My daughter did not like that. She kept telling me, don't do that. We had a lot of, you know, we had to fight some things out. But anyway. Finish that and then we'll get to the fight. Finish where you thought. You, yeah. you probably, you may or may not know this, but the A major first movement, part of it was destroyed in a fire and someone had to reconstruct it. Didn't oh, you know that? I guess not. It doesn't want to ring a bell. Huh? Interesting. And so so it was the, the first 62 measures were there and then the last four measures and somebody, hmm. I can't remember, I should know this, somebody reconstructed it. There are several, there are a couple of different reconstructions and maybe mm -hmm. your ear is so good that you noticed that that wasn't original Bach Oh, we had the, we did have this conversation. Fascinating. I did. I was not aware uh, of that of the detail you just spoke to. I was thinking more that he had that we were seeing a maturation of his of his compositional style, becoming more complex, more complex. There is that too. I'm sure that one came much later, probably mm -hmm. at the same time as the B minor. You know, those are considered the biggest two, ones. Yeah. The B minor is considered the most complex, yeah. and um, and then the A major and E major. And E minor, those that are on the second are the disc, that are mostly on the second disc, as I recall. We'll, we'll look at that, but so that's interesting that it, it's exactly, and we have we got a kind of sort of it's not quite quite all the heavy duties, but no, the, so there were four on the first disc yeah. and three on the second, and um, the ones that some people, you know, the scholars will all agree, disagree about everything, but as I mentioned, the C major, E flat, and G minor are three that some people speculate might be one of his sons. Hmm. I don't like to think that, but it's possible. By the way, it doesn't matter. Doesn't They're wonderful. Matter. Exactly. They're wonderful. Exactly. They're absolutely yeah. wonderful. I'm just going to throw a little bit about you since we're talking about the A major, uh, BWV 1032. Just from what I do is I listen and take stream of consciousness notes. Okay. And then yeah. later yeah. I try and figure out how I'm going to put this into a, a written review. Um, uh, and it's actually this one brings up a very interesting uh, question to me. But first of all, just in in general, the secret is keeping things moving, and you do yeah. that. But I also oh, noticed, right. and I kind of wanted to to ask you about it. Sophie, at first I thought she's push, she's always kind of pushing things a little bit, and I was a little disturbed at first. And then I realized that's wonderful performance practice. 
Every time she has a, a little moment, she is moving things forward. So that's another reason everything is so joyous because it's so up, upbeat and vibrant. Am I all that's wet? Very cute of you to mention that. No, you know, I, I mean, you, you might even say that maybe she rushes, which is very possible, or that I dragged. It's <laughs> probably are both true. You know, when you're working with musicians uh, who aren't your family members, um, when we're in a quartet situation, there's this whole protocol on how to say to somebody, you're right. You never say you're rushing. What you'll say to someone is, hmm, am I dragging there? And you're implying that they're pushing. And so there's all this sidestepping about how you work things out. When it's your own daughter or mother, we had our own little, of course. Of course. Um, but she was often telling me that I was slowing down, and I was often telling her that she was rushing. So you might have heard a little bit of that on the recording, and I don't mind. You right. know, sometimes you do let things get a little elastic. Sometimes you do take a little mm -hmm. more time, and then when the piano has the solo again, they uh -huh. can pick it up. Let me tell you. Let me tell you. First of all, I'm delighted by the by the cat fights. That it could be no other way with mother daughter, but I listened to this this rushing and I will not use that word it's not correct uh, yeah. I listened to the I first heard it immediately and I had you know wondered and then I listened through as you know all two C, both CDs it's exactly consistent it's very deliberate she knows exactly what she's doing and and yes it sounds like she's moving it a little bit but I'm speaking of conductors I'm reminded that there are passages where a conductor has to insist on pushing things forward in order for them to get back into some kind of stasis of, of, of vigor, if you will. So I would say that the compliment is Sophie's. It's not a, it's not a criticism, it's a compliment. That is nice. You know, I, I agree with you. Yeah. If it weren't for Sophie, you know, I would, <laughs> I would have ended every sonata at a metronome marking slower than I began. So See? That, that was good. She did keep me on the straight and narrow. You know, she would make us play things under tempo, and then she'd make us play them with the metronome, and she she kept me honest, that's for sure. She's yeah. her mother's daughter, apparently, so you deserve every bit of it, okay? Uh, uh, let me let me, no let me me talk about, because another one that I highlighted so that we wouldn't, uh, you know, have to kind of plow through everything, but it is, in fact, the E-flat major, uh, 1031, and this, of course, is one of the most famous of the flute yeah. sonatas. And let me see. Um, I love the nice, exactly correct, moderate tempo of the first move. Allegro moderato. Yes, 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 exactly. So you, you guys got that one beautifully, I thought. Um, and the cadential approaches, they're, 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 they're so sensitive throughout the CD, throughout the entire CD, the approach to cadences are, are so crucial in this period music. You know what I'm trying to say, just that, that little that little something that stretches, uh, dissolves the bar line just a little bit and then, then back into movement. So I, I, I found your playing, the two of your playing uh, uh, of the E flat, wonderful, the Siciliano, uh, everybody knows this one also. It's always so risky when everybody knows <laughs> what you're recording there with the other 17. Uh, wonderfully sensitive collaboration with Sophie. Uh, oh. Julie is playing it, and this is another very interesting thing about the subtlety of interpretation and or even accidental interpretation. Now what I'm saying, it just found in my notes here, it says Julie is playing straight up. And what I mean by that, especially in this movement, the Siciliano, it's moving. It's not, you're not get wallowing yourself down in idiocy. Yeah. You know, I can't think of any other. There's no excessive affectation. And this is also true throughout the entire two CD set, I think, because it's all very straightforward and yet has coming right out of your brain this magical magical is right wow. magical energy okay um but that's kind of that's what i'm getting at and we we, we t you, you mentioned the studio which you recorded at, at the radio station in, in uh, the fm station in, right the fm station in boston and that it, and i've had this experience also where a room you met you, you uh, i'm going to use the word dry where the acoustic in the in the moment is so dry you worry about things and as he mentioned sometimes things are boosted a little bit for reverb but if I may just congratulate the, the sound engineer the, the this is a just superb management of that space and its sound it's 
it's gorgeous. I can't think of any other way. And as I mentioned to you, I hear everything, which is the decision to use piano. And I don't mean to say it's about time, but what I do mean to say is it's okay, <laughs> very much okay to use a yeah. modern instrument in a modern age in the 21st century and so on. So, so it's amazing. I, I'm here to report to you that the recording quality, the, the, the sound that the engineers have, have created in that room is glorious. I heard I everything. Give me one second. A loud motor car just went by. Go ahead, repeat that. Yeah, sure, sure, sure. Antonio Oliart is his name. Thank you. He's, yes, I saw uh, him on that. Oh, yes, he's amazing. He he records all of our concerts too, all of wow. our live concerts. Wow. And they're all on our YouTube channel. If anyone's curious, by the oh, way. Um, they'll he, not only be curious, they'll be seeing some of them. I'll put them up on, on at Performing Arts Review for sure. Oh, nice, nice. Yeah. I I. I think he did an amazing job. Yeah. So um, yes, and you know, not it didn't just boost it a little. He, he, you had to add a lot of reverb for that room mm. because it was dry as a doornail. I mean, what don't know the expression Whatever that <laughs> makes more of a metaphor, man. No, not, nothing, nothing. That's that's what the recording studio uh, is amazing. is built for. Sure. So that um, then you can add what Play you with need. It. Oh, the, so yeah. there you go. I'm glad you qu kind of qualified that. Basically, for an engineer, a dead sound is what is perfect, because they can then, it, if they have any skills at all, they can play with it. Well, he, he's magnificent, and, and I did see his name yeah. in the credits, and it's just a glorious job. I want to have a look uh, at how we're doing here. I want to have a look at, at the B minor sonata 1030, because you and I and most of the world, uh, most of the intelligent world knows that B minor is a very, very important key area for this composer, the B minor mass, and so on. Right. Not that they need to connect, I don't need to do any musicological, uh, you know, voodoo here, but uh, what I find is so wonderful also about your playing, it's this thing, this first movement I'm th thinking of, the Andante, and as you know very well, it, th it's a big exercise in sustaining the energy, the yes. energy, let alone the sound, but sustaining that energy and also keeping it very, very even. Uh, and, yeah. and precise. So you did a glorious job here. I love the statement response bits between the two of you. And nice. it's written, you know, everybody who plays it has statement response, but there's something that is, mm, I hate to be cornball and say mother, daughter, but there's like this, this talk about intuitive. Oh, no, that's nice to hear. So. That's nice to hear. I mean, we have to, um, you know, we have to single out our CD in some way so that there was a reason for, for making another recording. So I love hearing that you felt there was some kind of um, connection between us. And you know, I felt that from the very first time I played with my daughter when she was, I think our first real public, public meaning on a real stage on our series was when she was 16 and we played a Chopin Nocturne that we had arranged for piano and flute. And um, it, she's still my favorite pianist and she, I feel that she just is, you know, is so, so sensitive to my breathing, to my phrases following me. It's, it's quite amazing. So I'm it. with you with that. Thank you. Yeah. You got it exactly right. And you'll be sure to play this back to her. <laughs> she listens to it. <laughs> you, so that you can persuade her out of the, out of the, whatever, out of the, out of the deep forests or something. I'm, I'm joking, of course, but I want to make sure that we're speaking about it. Did you, what, give me a little idea, I, I forgot even to mention her little bio, but give me a little, what is her piano training experience? Oh, she did actually, well, she went to Harvard undergrad, like my son, um, and she majored in psychology there, and and, um, and then went to NEC, New England Conservatory, for her master's yeah. in chamber music. Yeah. She was yeah. uh, with a piano trio back then, mm -hmm. and... Um, and then she's done a lot of festivals. She's done Fontainebleau in yeah, France yeah, and Prague, something in Spain, and um, a few more things. Oh, La Jolla in California ah, is a very well known Yes, with Heichiro Oyama back, back in my day, Heichiro Oyama. Yeah, she did Perlman Music Program as well. Um, things like that. Okay, so things but like that, never, she says offhandedly. Uh, so she, basic. She's an interesting girl, though, because she. She can't stand the rat race of the music world, and she doesn't really want to hustle to, to to find the concerts. I'm hoping that my children will take over my series someday, 
but I'm not sure that's going to happen. But that, uh, uh, very interesting you come on this point because, again, we are all, really, most of the audience, are we're in the profession. You know, we're, we're faculty members or, or, or professional musicians yeah. and, and administrators and so on. And this is, you, you said rat race. And I often have thought, because I happily had a lower level career, <laughs> what I mean by that is I've never been particularly stressed. And I think, yeah. look at all the people I speak to and that we all, all know and, and see on television and everything. If you're t tremendously successful, you become kind of locked in. And it does exactly. become kind of a rat race. You can't decide, I'll take a year I, to write a book, for example, what, whatnot. Yeah, you know, I probably shouldn't have used that term because, first of all, let me turn this thing off. I'm so sorry, that no noise. Problem. You're supposed to say... Well, it could be at my end. doesn't matter. There you go. No, I did a bad thing. Okay. Anyway, um, what I really meant was not that you get so busy that you have no life, but mostly that you have to work so hard to mm. promote yourself. That's the part that I call the rat race. Mm -hmm. um, because one of the reasons, um, I was a very busy freelancer back before I started my series. I was playing every job I could get my hands on, and I was, sometimes there were three services a day, you know, morning rehearsal, afternoon rehearsal, evening show or performance, and that was just crazy, and I had young children. But if you said no to anything, you never knew if they were gonna call you again. That was not, I did not think that was a great way to live. And um, even though I enjoyed my jobs, I loved playing for the ballet and the opera. But when I started my own series, it was really to put my artistic -like life back in my own control. And once I realized that I could choose the music I loved with the people I love to play with and bring something special to my community and connect with my community in a way that freelancing and orchestras didn't afford me, that's when I realized I had found my own calling. But in a way, it was it was such a relief. Even though this is a lot of work that I do now, it's so much more gratifying for me. And I had meant to bring that up about how did I actually start my own my own thing, and that's what the story was. Okay, and we had the talk uh, uh, off and on throughout the conversation. I'm in the same boat. I start my own thing, and I'm yeah. a happy guy. But yeah. it's hard, hard work, and and sometimes we burn out on it. But, Started my own chamber music yeah. festival, all American music, and nobody came. What can I say? <laughs> Stuff like that. So uh, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm frankly glad yes. not to be a, an entrepreneur in that sense, trying to put together a concert, get bodies into the room, and, and all the rest of it. But, uh, but I, so I, I guess what I'm saying is I really admire people who can, who have a head on their shoulders. Maybe. That's How's that? Nice. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Okay. Let's see. What else, what have I forgotten? I mean, there's so so much. I'm just trying to. I think I'm about done with kind of any overviews that we hardly started the B minor sonata, which everybody uh, you know knows is one of the most important ones. But let me just uh, just say that uh, what was so interesting. I'm looking at my stream of consciousness stuff. This the, it's so tremendously and skillfully uh, developed by Bach. This B minor sonata in particular. Uh, interesting harmonic travels as well. And that I really perked my ears up when I finally could hear some of these really, really rather quiet uh, dissonances that that you don't really hear on harpsichord, frankly. Uh, but it yes. it shows where his mind was. It's so simple and lovely, the the Largo, for example, played with exquisite oh. care by both, and so on. Thank you so much. Thank you. I'm so happy you said those things. I agree with you about hearing more with the piano, and um, and being able to do these very special things yeah exactly uh, right. taking time and you know I what we like to call magic moments where we just take an extra little moment before some harmony changes exactly. for instance that's exactly yeah. that, that, uh, like, like, as I said the, it's about approaching cadences about understanding yeah. it, there's a there's a half yeah. not half cadence a phony cadence in here in one of these sonatas somewhere where and you the two of you elegantly get right up to that cadence and then say just kidding <laughs> and off you go again it's, nice. it's super. Oh, thanks, so yeah. having that kind of consciousness is, is one, an understanding of all of this is wonderful I think I'm worn out how are you doing how do you have anything yeah. anything else you are dying to tell what? us on I wanted to commend you for listening to both CDs in one afternoon. You must be so sick of, of me. You know, this whole day has been about me. So thank you for that. I like, I admire you and I appreciate it because then you have it really in your head and you, 
in your ears and you, and you know you're not just trying to remember what you heard two months ago yeah there's I, no other so. way to do it the catch is yeah. that I that I don't write the written review right away because yeah. for me the written review is the worst chore of all because yeah. I'm good I mean I'm I'm serious here I arrange words and yeah. I'm very fussy about it so so I, I so that that happens a little later but uh, but I, um, yeah. anyway, anyway thank, you. thank you for the compliments yeah. Uh, anything else before we shut her down? No, I just I can't believe anybody listens to a whole hour of. Oh, of oh, us. let me answer. Let me answer that, uh, because I did go in kicking and screaming this morning a little bit, and again I only touch. I, I have a day for each, and you know, yeah. uh, uh, Sunday I'm you know interviewing somebody about an Esco violin sonatas in Bucharest or something, but the, yeah. and I'm not just throwing words out. I'm just saying that's how come I need to just focus on the day for the event. Yeah. Uh, yes, I had planned a little more, uh, little cut stuff I was going to do before and stuff, and you, and you did want to want to get together at three o'clock. But the more important thing is, as I've mentioned two or three times already, first couple of notes go on. I'm in kind of a mood and thinking, oh my God, I'm going to have to go through the two discs of these six sonatas. It's going to be forever. Seven, seven, seven sonatas. Aren't there seven? Aren't there seven? There are seven. You know what? Seven. You have just corrected that. I have been so confused all day because I see two editions, three each. And then I went, no, wait, wait a minute. One, two, three, four, five, seven. What, what, what? And I tried to track down which was the missing sonata, but you're quite right. There are seven. Yeah. Anyway, well now you've destroyed you've destroyed my <laughs> my oldest. But uh, but actually, what I'm going to say once again, uh, you know, again for the umpteenth time, and that's what makes it so special. That's why I can't wait to get this out for people to have a look at. Is the, the energy, the energy, and the joy of it all. It's it's very it's very different this album because it's so consistently joyful that's the only word I can think of to use that positive attitude about life and so on it's not nonsense it's not propaganda it's how one lives one's life and so these two discs are joyful from beginning to end so so the question was I played the first few notes and I was hooked I mean it was a, th a thrill it was a dance-a-thon it was you know the whole room for the first time in a zillion years in my in my ear and, and everything was just just came to vibrant life it's the best compliment wow. i can possibly give you <laughs> that's amazing i love that compliment thank you so much it's such a pleasure to meet you indeed i will I'll go be, find it it took us I a will, while but that I that goes find. up the territory anyway uh, a wonderful chat we've had i've been speaking with flutist uh, julie skolnick about your 2022 Navona Records two CD release by be beautiful packaging all, all of it. They, they do such a great job. Uh, uh, this is of the complete seven Bach sonatas. Finally, I can get some sleep tonight because that bothered me for a while. I was seeing six and seeing seven and so on. Anyway, the seven flute sonatas uh, of Bach played with your daughter, piano Sophie Solnick, uh, Skolnick, excuse me, Brower, uh, on modern piano. Perfect. That's it so much okay we're done thanks bye-bye you clicked off button now i can just say